and you've got another week to practice that one. Okay, so this afternoon as we sail away from the Venice of Brazil, um, I've got to take my tongue out of my cheek there, um, I'm going to be telling you all about a boy's own adventure, which is the Contiki expedition. Now, uh, this was a, an expedition that was carried out in 1947, so just a couple of years after the end of World War II, when the world needed good news stories. And this was all about a group of six Scandinavian men, five Norwegians and a Swede, who built a raft made of balsa wood logs, and they named that raft the Kontiki, after the Inca sun god Tiki, and the idea that they were going to try and prove a scientific theory that it was possible that in pre-Columbus days, when before the conquistadors uh, had reached South America, that there was, it was possible that people had migrated from South America to the Polynesian islands of the Pacific, which was totally against the, uh, the thinking at that time. And the man who came up with that theory was the expedition leader, Tor Heidel. He'd been born in 1914. His parents were both academics. They both worked at the University of Oslo, where he went to school as well. And he uh, studied nature and zoology. And in his final years of study at the year of study at the university, he applied for and he was given permission to go to the island of Fatuhiva in the Marquesas group of islands of French Polynesia to study the migration of sea life and birds in that region. The day before he left, he married his childhood sweetheart, Liv, so she could come along with him, and this would be their honeymoon. And it's a beautiful place, Fatu Hiva. It's up here in the Marquesas. And just to give you an idea of, of whereabouts that is in the Pacific, this is Tahiti here, about 1,500 miles to the southwest of Fatu Hiva. And the other island we're going to be talking about today is uh, this one here, Reoa. That's going to figure heavily in this presentation as well. So you can see that Fatu Hiva isn't such a bad place to have a honeymoon. And they were there for two and a half years. And while they were there, each morning they would take a walk along the beach. And most mornings they were able to see things that had washed up on that beach. And a lot of this stuff, it looked like it came from South America. There was things with Spanish writing on it. There was plants like uh, sweet potato, which is native to the Americas, uh, isn't grown naturally anywhere else. And they had, that had landed onto this beach. And he also noticed that the prevailing current, the famous Humboldt current, came all the way across from the east to the west. And that the prevailing winds also came from the east to the west. And this started getting him thinking. He also noticed that the idols that they worshipped, the uh, sun idol that they worshipped on the in French Polynesia, were very similar to the idols that they worshipped in uh, in South America as well. So he started talking to some of the elders on the island, and they told him stories that had been passed down from generation to generation from generation about how. The people of the region had followed the sun god Tiki as it moved across the sky and they'd come to these islands uh, across from the seas. So he started uh, a theory that perhaps these people, po the Polynesian people, had originated in South America instead of originating in the, uh, the other areas. And he... Uh, now, the, it's not such a bad theory because French Polynesia is basically slap dang in the middle of the Pacific, halfway between Australia and South America. But the prevailing theory at the time, scientific theory, was that the people of Polynesia had first originated in uh, southern Asia around the Taiwan area and over a period of centuries had moved down through, uh, down to uh, the uh, Philippines and Malaysia, across into what's known now as Micronesia, Melanesia, and then finally into Polynesia. And Polynesia, the Polynesian Triangle, is basically Hawaii in the north, New Zealand in the south, out to Easter Island in the east. And it was thought that even then, perhaps people had migrated even further and they had occupied South America. But um, when he published this, um, this theory of his in scientific magazines, it was lambasted. Every, all the scientists criticised him, uh, said that he was just a young upstart who was trying to make a name for himself by espousing a very controversial and wrong theory. So he thought that he would try and prove his theory. But before he could do that, World War II broke out. 
He served with the uh, Norwegian government in exile in London until 1944 where he joined the Norwegian Free Forces and fought for Norway. And then um, while they were in London, Tor uh, and Liv had uh, two sons, Tor Jr. and Bjorn. But after the war, he decided to try and prove his theory. He assembled a crew of men, and a team of men, and I'd just like to try and introduce each of these to you individually. Now, the first man was Eric Hesselberg, who was a navigator and artist. He actually created the, uh, the Tiki logo on the sail of the Contiki. Um, he was a childhood friend of Heidel. He was the only person that had any sailing experience on this expedition. In fact, Heidel himself had never learnt to swim and uh, couldn't swim for the rest of his life, which made um, what he did later on during this voyage and other voyages even more remarkable. Now, after the, um, the Contiki expedition finished, he, uh, uh, Hesselberg wrote the book Contiki and I. And I'll just say before that I think this is probably the very first book that I ever read um, at, in school. It was required reading at school. I can't think of a, a book I read before that. It certainly inspired me and inspired a lot of other people as well to have their own adventures. It was translated into 15 languages and became an international bestseller. Uh, he was able to use the proceeds of that uh, that. Uh, book to uh, build himself a, uh, a nice yacht which he also named Contiki and he sailed that yacht on the Mediterranean between France and Italy. Uh, he became a renowned artist. He was very good friends with a uh, lot of people in the French and the Italian artworks, uh, art world including Bridget Bardot and Pablo Picasso and people like that. The next man is the Swede, the lone Swede on this expedition, Bent Danielson. Now, originally Heidel wanted to have an all-Norwegian crew, but Danielson had uh, a couple of attributes that no one else he could find did have. First of all, he was willing to do all the cooking. Uh, the second one is that he was the only person who actually spoke any Spanish. So he was going to be very handy during the construction phase of the uh, the raft and also negotiating with all the um, the Spanish, the, uh, the South American authorities. He, um, after Contiki, he married Marie Therese. They actually lived on Rayatoa Atoll, which is the, uh, the island where the Contiki uh, ended up for two and a half years. He, uh, he wrote books and movie scripts and, and magazine articles. He became one of the, the most renowned experts in the South, of, around the South Pacific and Polynesia. He was actually one of the technical advisors on the movie South Pacific. And he got the gig. It's not a bad gig. Swedish consul in French Polynesia from 1961 to 78. Couldn't think of much better than that. Uh, but he was also a, a very much an opponent of French nuclear testing in the Pacific and was controversial with some of his views in that. Nort Hagland, who was the radio operator. Now, to do justice to the story of Nort Hagland, I would need another 45 minutes. This guy is just absolutely amazing. Um, and... The reason he, uh, uh, Heidel wanted him on the, along on this voyage because if he came, he knew there would be a lot of pub uh, popular publicity uh, back in Norway. But he was a Norwegian war hero during World War II. He was actually involved on that famous raid on the Norse Hydro Factory. Now, this was a, a plant that was producing heavy water, the only plant in Europe capable of, using, of producing that heavy water, and the Nazis were using it to try and produce their own atomic weapon. British and uh, French and Norwegian scientists told British intelligence it had to be destroyed at all costs. Now, a low altitude, a precision bombing raid wasn't an option because of all that, those mountains around that area. And using high altitude carpet bombing wasn't an option either because the, the local village was very close by and hundreds of Norwegian civilians would have been killed and that wasn't palatable to the Norwegian government in exile back in London. So they decided that there would have to be a commando raid. So Operation Freshman and Up Operation Gunnerside were put into place. So this meant that, um, that the plan was that um, they were going to land British uh, commandos via glider to try and destroy the factory. So Hogland and three other Norwegian men, were, the plan was they were going to be sent in as a, uh, as a reconnaissance, reconnaissance um, 
patrol. They were going to parachute in and they were going to identify a landing site for gliders. The British would arrive via gliders and they would storm the factory and blow it up. But um, when that, um, that plane was travelling over from England to Norway, it came under attack from a German night fighter. The four Norwegians had to parachute um, out and they weren't able to take a lot of their equipment. When they landed, they were more than 300 miles away from the predicted the uh, rendezvous point with the resistance. They didn't have a lot of their equipment, so they took three weeks to travel through the ice, the snow, and all the mountainous areas of Norway to the rendezvous point. When they got there, they were absolutely exhausted. Um, they were starving at that time. They took a couple of weeks to recover. They were able to radio back to British intelligence with the phrase three pink elephants, which was code to say that they were uh, in place and that they weren't under duress from the Gestapo. Uh, there was another code there that if they were under duress, they'd use that code to uh, warn the, warn the uh, British. But um, they, after a couple of weeks of recovering, they identified a landing site, which was a, uh, an ice over um, uh, lake, and Operation uh, Gunnerside began. Now, that was two gliders full of uh, British commandos that were being pulled over by bombers. And because of all the delays, this was now late November, and the weather was awful in that region, one of those, those um, tow planes struck trouble it crash landed into a mountain and the, um, the glider behind it also crash landed. The other plane also got into trouble. They had to cut the wire and uh, it returned to base, but the, um, the glider crash landed. Now, a lot of the commandos were killed, uh, but some were captured, most, all the survivors were captured by the Germans. Um, now, they were treated under an infamous order that was issued by uh, Hitler that if anyone was, any uh, soldiers were found behind enemy lines, didn't matter whether they were in uniform or not, they were considered saboteurs or spies and they were to be executed out of hand. So these survivors, these British commandos, even though they were in full uniform, they were tortured by the Gestapo and then they were taken out and they were shot and their bodies were thrown into a swamp. And now the Germans had been warned. They knew that um, the British were interested in this plant, this hydro plant, and security at the plant was beefed up. So another plan was put into place. This plant had to be destroyed. So the British flew over another load of uh, Norwegian commandos. They parachuted down and they linked up with Horgman and his team. And now by this time, they, they went to the, the factory now, they couldn't approach it from the, the rear, from the, um, the back of the factory, because that was all patrolled by men and dogs, and there was lots of minefields there. There was a deep ravine at the front of it, and the only way you could get over that was by a steel bridge, which was only about wide enough to fit one car. It was heavily guarded, so you couldn't storm across that. There'd be no chance of survival. So they did what some, that something that no one thought could be done. They scaled down the side of that ravine in the pitch dark in winter. They crossed the stream, the below, the fast running stream, and then with, they were, with icy cold fingers and wet clothing, they scaled up the other side of that ravine. The, it wasn't guarded because the Germans considered that this was absolutely impossible, but they did it. They made their way into the factory. They planted explosives. They also planted a couple of British weapons and a British beret uh, to show the Germans that this was a British raid, not a Norwegian raid, so that the Nazis wouldn't take uh, reprisals against the local population. The, uh, the plant was blown up. Uh, it was uh, damaged, severely damaged, and it was put out of operation for several months, and the Germans were never able to develop their nuclear weapons. A German officer later called this the finest coup of the entire war. Now, there was a movie made about this. You might have seen it, The Heroes of Tallymark. It uh, starred Kurt Douglas and uh, Richard Harris. Hoagland hated this movie. He said it was wildly inaccurate. It was just Hollywood hype. So he worked with the BBC, and he, they produced a documentary called The Real Heroes of Tallymark that tells the real story. And if you get the chance to see it, highly recommend you have a look at it. He was captured twice. He did some more um, work with the resistance in, uh, in Norway. He was captured by the Gestapo twice, but he was able to escape on both times. 
He was awarded Norway's highest decoration for gallantry, which is the war cross with sword twice. So this is the equivalent of winning the Victoria Cross or the Medal of Honour twice. He also won the British Distinguished Service Order and the Military Medal, the French Croix de Guerre and the uh, Legion of Honour and the American Medal of Freedom. Now, he went on to have a magnificent diplomatic career after the, uh, the Contiki expedition. Um, and uh, people say I've got a good memory, but I'm afraid I'm going to have to read all these out to you. He was awarded the Knight First Class of the Order of Vasa, which is a Swedish award, the Knight First Class of the Order of Dunenberg, which is a Danish award, uh, the Knight of the Icelandic Order of the Falcon, First Class Cross of the Federal Republic of Germany's Order of Merit. Keep your eye on how many different countries we're talking about here the commander of the Belgium Order of Leopold, the companion of the Order of the Crown of Thailand, the officer of the Iranian Order of the Lion and the Sun, the Grand Decoration of Honour and Gold for Services to the Republic of Austria, uh, the Peruvian Order of Merit for Distinguished Service. He uh, was a Knight First Class, the Order of St. Olive, the Defence Medal with three stars, and he became the very first director of the Contiki Museum in, uh, in Oslo. He would be an absolute disaster, a nightmare if you had to introduce him in an official function, wouldn't he? Now, the other radio operator along on this trip was a man by the name of Torsten Rabi. He was also a Norwegian resistance hero. He'd stayed behind uh, when the Nazis occupied Norway, and he radioed information back to British intelligence, mostly about German shipping that was hiding in Norwegian fjords. On one famous occasion, he was in a little village at the end of, of a fjord. It was surrounded by mountains, and his signals weren't strong enough to be able to get out to British intelligence. There was a German officer who was billeted in that town who was a ham radio nut, and he would uh, communicate with his family back in Germany, and he had a large aerial. So Hoagland uh, rented the apartment next door, and he hooked up his radio, wired his radio to the Germans antenna and he was able to send traffic back to British intelligence. Absolutely amazing. He was also involved in uh, letting British intelligence know about the movements of the German battleship the Tirpitz, which was the sister ship to the Bismarck, and the RAF were able to come over, bomb the Tirpitz, put it out of action for the rest of the war. It had no impact on the rest of the war. He was also awarded the at highest decoration, the war cross with sword. And then after the Contiki expedition finished, he became a bit of a recluse. He, um, he went and lived on Bear Island in the Canadian Arctic. And it was believed, it was, there was a lot of rumours around, that he was part of a secret group who were listening in on Soviet communications in that area. But he died of a heart attack during an expedition uh, to ski to the North Pole in 1964. Is that my stomach? My um, the last man I wanted to talk to you about was uh, the engineer, Herman Watzinger. And isn't this a great photo for an engineer? He was the second in command of the expedition, and he was the man that was responsible for the construction of the raft, but also for some of the experiments that I'll tell you about in a few minutes. Um, he lived in South America for most of his life, uh, he also re had a very distinguished career, both diplomatic and business. He was awarded the, um, the Order of Merit for Services, Distinguished Services for Peru. And afterwards, he was made direct, uh, Deputy Director General of the United Nations Food and Agriculture Board. Another remarkable career. So just on the raft itself, now... Um, they received a lot of the information from diaries that had been found from the con Spanish conquistadors. And there was lots of drawings in these diaries about these, these massive rafts that the local people had had at that time. So they had quite a lot of information. And when they were building the rafts, Heidel wanted to build it with exactly the same uh, materials uh, and the way, exactly the way it was built back in, in those days. They weren't going to use any modern materials. So... It was going to be made out of balsa wood. Now, I remember when I was a kid, we used to be able to buy little packets of balsa wood and we would open them up and you'd make little planes. And they were very, it was very light, very brittle sort of wood. I don't know if the rest of you remember it. Um, but balsa wood is actually classed as a hardwood. It is the softest of the hardwoods, but it's still classed as a hardwood. has a lot of oil in the wood itself. 
which is good because it means that water doesn't penetrate as much. But in the, in the, um, the days before the war, there was huge forests made up of balsa wood uh, trees. But in the post-construction period after the war, a lot of those forests were decimated. So they had to travel 100 miles up a Peruvian river until they came across a forest of these trees that were big enough to build this raft. They had to wait until the, the full moon, so the maximum amount of oil was in these trees before they cut them down. And with the help of the Peruvian Navy, they floated the logs down the river to a Peruvian naval base when they'd start the um, assembling the raft itself. And it was made up of these nine huge logs, which were 14 metres or 45 feet long. And they had a diameter of around about two feet in diameter. And across them, they were going to put cross pieces across. And these were going to be five and a half metres long and one foot in diameter. And then across the top of that, they built a, um, a bamboo f uh, deck. And in that deck, they had little compartments, little trap doors. And in those trap doors, there was a space down below between those two um, uh, tiers of logs. And that's where they stored all their food, water and equipment down there as well. Now, the, um, the mast was going to be an A-frame mast. It was about 30 feet high. And I'll explain why it was a, uh, how an A-frame mast works in just a minute. And um, this is how they cut grooves into the logs so that um, they would be able to pull them together a lot tighter than they would normally be. And they, fast, they used this hemp that they, they um, made themselves with the help of the Peruvian Navy. So it was all uh, handmade and, and homemade uh, hemp. And then they p p uh, joined them together. With the bamboo deck, they also built a bamboo cabin. And they also had a, 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 a oar that was also came from a mangrove swamp as well. Now, you see that A-frame. It starts on both sides of the deck and goes up to that 30-foot uh, level. Now, when the, mast, the, uh, the sail was put on there, because it's an A-frame, it meant that it couldn't be manoeuvred from side to side like a normal sailboat would. This boat, this raft, was only going in one direction, and that was the way the wind was pushing it and the way the currents were going to be pushing it as well. It could not be manoeuvred or turned around or anything like that. And this will give you a bit better of an idea. Now, that A-frame mast with the sail there going in one direction and the oar out the back there, that was really only used, it wasn't used for steering, it was used to keep the, the stern of the boat, the back of the boat, uh, square on to the prevailing swell so that the boat was more stable as it moved through the water. And as I said, you wouldn't be able to manoeuvre the boat. They set out from Calio and Peru on the 28th of April 1947. Before they left, though, they were required by the Peruvian government to sign waivers to ab absolve the Peru any Peruvians of any responsibility whatsoever. The Peruvian Navy had told the government that um, there was no way that they were going to make it. This, this raft would fall apart uh, in a week or so. They were towed out by the Navy past the shipping lanes, and then they were cut free. And the first month, they actually headed north, which surprised them until they caught that Humboldt current and they headed, started heading out towards the Pacific. And this is the route that they, they took. Now, there was the, uh, the expedition was largely sponsored by the United States Navy. Uh, the Navy had lost a lot of um, uh, aviators during the war. Uh, who had been shot down or had, uh, had to ditch because of mechanical issues. They'd lost a lot of seamen through uh, ships and submarines who had been um, uh, uh, put on the ocean waves. And it was very hard to spot these people. So a lot of the experiments were to do with survival at sea. Um, two of the men were re of the six men were required to eat just U.S. Navy survival rations, so they could compare how they um, reacted to those rations as opposed to the other men who were basically on a, a seafood diet. They also did some other um, experiments. Um, they, the Navy had developed a powder, and if you put that powder into a, a, a bright orange balloon and you added seawater to it, it would produce a, a gas a bit like hydrogen. It would expand the balloon, and the balloon would float up into the air under a, attached by a string, and it would be much easier to see a downed airman with this uh, big orange balloon that would be a little tiny dot on the ocean. And they did a few other experiments in regard to um, 
uh, shark repellents and things, but as we'll see, that, didn't, that wasn't all that effective. They also did some other experiments re regarding drinking water. Apparently, if you catch a fish and that fish is fresh enough, you can cut into the lymph glands of that fish and the seawater that's gone through the gills uh, and been filtered through those gills and goes through that lymph gland, you can open up the lymph gland and there's actually a bit of fresh water within those lymph glands so that they could use that water for survival. They looked at things like mixing fresh water and sea water and what ratios you would need to do to, make, to be able to put salts back into your body, but also to uh, uh, not go crazy from, that, um, uh, from all that sea water as well. And while they were traveling, they discovered two new species of fish of marine life, including the firefly squid, which brought, is uh, lun uh, lun luminous and, and uh, lights up at night time. And these are some scenes from the, um, uh, from the Contiki during its trip. This is Heidel doing some work, probably putting his log in. Behind it, you've got the, uh, the route, the map with the route of the Contiki, uh, doing some washing up by the look of things. Uh, this is, uh, as I said, the, the back of the boat had to be um, uh, square on to the prevailing swells. And you can see some of those swells were quite big swells as they crossed the ocean. This is uh, the, uh, the radio operators, uh, Rabi and uh, Hagelin, doing, the, um, uh, look, doing some maintenance on the radios, probably train, uh, changing some of those valves. Now, the radios were fairly controversial. Um, later, people criticized uh, uh, Heidel and said, well, this wasn't really a proper experiment. You had modern equipment. You had sextants. You had radios on board. I mean, the, uh, the ancient Incas and the ancient Aztecs didn't have that equipment, so it's not a real experiment. And Heidel countered that by saying, I wanted to prove that they could uh, make it across the Pacific on these rafts. Uh, the, other, the equipment is just... Um, uh, ancillary to that. It just um, it was used for, for safety purposes. And the radios became very important because the world was fascinated by this. As I said, this was just after World War II. The world was looking for good news stories, and this was a great good news story. Six handsome, young, strapping Scandinavians who were on a boy's own adventure, and the world couldn't get enough of this. So they initially radioed back to places like Los Angeles and then Hawaii and later New Zealand every day with news about where they were and what they were doing. Newspapers ran serials about the adventures of the Contiki. It made news headlines all around the world. And people all around the world bought radio sets so they could listen in on what was happening. And these radio sets became very popular. Um, the national radio um, company who, who had supplied the radios sold tens of thousands of these all around the world and they would later advertise them by saying they had a 110-day salt uh, spray test. This is some more life aboard the, uh, the Contiki. Um, Danielson are reading a book there. Now, most of their, um, their diet consisted of uh, seafood, and this is a, a Dorito or a, a Maui Maui, I, I think it's called in some places as well. This was their favorite food. And, uh, but they also had a lot of experience with sharks. Now, sharks had been a big problem to them from the very start. As soon as they'd left, the, uh, the raft was virtually surrounded by sharks all the time. This was very disappointing for them because they were sailing through the tropics. It was very hot. The, uh, what they'd love to have done would have been able to tie a rope around their waist, jump into the water to cool themselves off and get back on. But they couldn't because of these sharks. So one day they decided to do something about it. They were going to cull the sharks. And within a couple of hours, they captured nine sharks and dragged them onto the boat, onto the raft. The trouble is, what do you do with nine sharks what you've, once you've got them? Um, I mean, you can't leave them there because they'll rot and they'll stink. You can't possibly eat all the flesh on nine sharks. So what they had to do in the end is throw them back in the water, and that just attracted more sharks. So it was a bit of a problem. They had another encounter with sharks one day. Now, as I said, that, that they were square on to the swells that came out uh, from behind, and uh, some of those swells were big. The back of the raft was constantly wet and it became very slippery. And one day, Watsinger was walking past there. He slipped and he fell into the water. Now, 
there was no way that they could stop the raft or, eat, or turn it around to go back and get him. If he couldn't be saved, he was lost. Without a moment's hesitation, Hoagland, the war hero, picked up a piece of rope that was lying on the deck, one piece of that rope. He dove in and swam out towards Watsinger. As the other four men frantically searched around the, the raft for the other end of that rope, now, luckily, he reached Watsinger just as the rope ran out and they were able to be dragged back to the Contiki. Uh, Watsinger swears that as they were being dragged back, he was bumped at least on two occasions by sharks before they got back to the boat. Um, Heidel later described the actions of Hoagland as the, the bravest thing that he had ever seen. But they also invented one of the very first shark cages, now, this was absolutely necessary because these are nine logs who were just tied together by rope. They weren't um, uh, nailed or anything like that. They were just tied together with rope. So they would obviously, in those swells, all move independently. They would constantly be stretching those homemade hemp ropes. So those ropes had to be tightened every single day, several times a day. But what about the ropes underneath the raft? They had to be inspected as well. The bottom of the raft had to be inspected for any damage. So they, in they invented this shark um, cage. And this was just a wicker basket that it nor would normally hold uh, coconuts. And they emptied the coconuts out. They put three bamboo poles in it. They tied ropes around those bamboo poles. And they were able to lower it into water. Someone would get in and uh, with a pair of uh, goggles and be able to inspect the, the bottom of the raft for any uh, re necessary repairs that needed to be done. Not the sort of thing that I'd like to do, that's for sure. They had another encounter with a, a shark, and this time it was a whale shark, something that they'd never seen or heard of before. And this is just a, a photo of a whale shark, just to give you the, pers the, uh, the scale beside a, a, an adult diver there. Huge things. Now, this thing arrived one day, swam up beside the raft. It was longer than this raft. They were absolutely terrified when they saw it. They thought that with one flick of its tail, it would break up the Contiki. They'd all be flung into the water and there'd be the mercy of this monster. They had no idea that it wasn't a carnivore. It only ate plankton. So they grabbed a, a, a harpoon that was laying on the deck and they stabbed it and it thinking, well, this isn't very friendly, uh, the, the whale shark swam away. After 45 days, they reached the halfway mark of their voyage, and they were now 2,500 nautical miles away from any sort of uh, land. Uh, they were doing an average speed of 42.5 um, nautical miles per day. On 93, they sighted land, which is one of the islands of the Marquesas group of islands, and then four days later, they came into the first human contact they'd had uh, for three months, and uh, where um, they were passing by an island, natives saw this raft go by. Can't imagine what those natives must have been thinking. What the? And so a couple of them jumped into canoe, rowed out to ask the Contiki whether they were okay. The men on the Contiki said, "We're all good. We're all good," and they sailed on. And then on day 101, which was the 7th of August, 1947, they were coming directly towards Rayola Island. There was no way that they could avoid the island, even if they wanted to. Now, Rayola Island is, um, is, is surrounded by two reefs, an outer reef and an inner reef. So they were making for the outer reef. They uh, radioed New Zealand and told them where they were and said that if you don't hear from us in 36 hours, please send help. And then they lashed everything they could down to the, uh, onto the deck of the Contiki. They tied themselves to the Contiki and then they were at the mercy of the waves. And several waves picked them up and carried them forward. And then finally one huge wave picked up the Contiki. Luckily, it carried them over the outer reef of, uh, of the island and it became, the Contiki became wedged onto the inner reef of the island and it remained intact. They were just able to step off into a lagoon type area and walk over at low tide, take all their equipment over to Rayoa Island. Not such a bad place to be shipwrecked, is it? So they took all their, their equipment, their supplies over there. They radioed New Zealand and told them where they were and asked for them to send help, uh, send a ship. At high tide, they were able to go out to the reef and they were able to refloat the Contiki and bring it in towards the beach. Now, they stayed on the island for a week. 
uh, before they were picked up and they were taken over to an inhabited island. And while they were there, they actually performed a life-saving operation on a young child. They were the only people there with any medical implements, scalpels and things like that, that they'd taken with them. Um, and they received instructions on how to conduct this operation uh, via radio from New Zealand. And they probably saved that child's life. And then the Contiki was towed to, to Tahiti. It was put on a ship, taken back to Oslo, and it now rests at the Contiki Museum in um, uh, Oslo. After the expedition, these men were absolutely famous. They were superstars all around the world. They did a lot of uh, uh, newsreel interviews. They did a lot of um, magazine interviews, newspaper interviews. They visited the White House and presented the flag that they'd taken with them to President Harry S. Truman. Uh, they, and um, they also, uh, Heidel uh, made a documentary about the voyage and it uh, won the Academy Award for Best Documentary in 1951, and that uh, statuette is also at the museum in Oslo. So back in 2018, Lee and I were invited uh, to visit the, the Kontiki Museum by Tor Heyerdahl Jr., the son of the great man. Uh, we got to spend a, a couple of hours with, with uh, Tor Jr., a wonderful, wonderful man. Uh, we, we talked a lot about his, his youth growing up with the same name as the most famous man in Norway. Um, Tor Senior and Liv had divorced shortly before the Kontiki expedition began and Tor Junior was estranged from his father for many, many years and that was very difficult for him. But eventually they came together, they got on well and Tor Junior actually went on uh, adventures and expeditions including the one to Easter Island with his father. Marvellous, marvellous man. Um, he personally escorted us around the, exp the, uh, the museum um, and uh, showed us everything that was there. It was absolutely fantastic. Now, as I said, this expedition inspired me and probably one of the reasons that I joined the Navy, but it inspired a lot of other people around the world as well. And in 1970, 12 men from seven different nations built three rafts, basically the same as the Contiki, and they also sailed from Peru. But they went further. They came all the way across the Pacific to the east coast of Australia. Over the journey, the rafts had um, split up. Uh, one ended up south uh, uh, near um, in New South Wales, but one raft came to where we used to live on the Sunshine Coast in Queensland. After When it got within nine miles of the coast, it was um, towed in so it would avoid all the shipping off the coast. And it was put in an area just opposite the Yacht Club where I'd, um, we talked about Fedor the other day. There was nothing there at that time. It was just vacant land. And they were, th they were told to stay there uh, and they would be quarantined for a month. Now, back in those days, quarantines weren't all that effective in Queensland, apparently, because uh, the local men thought that these, these lads have come a long way. They deserve a beer. Um, they might have some fishing tips. So every night after work, all these men would take down uh, uh, what we call an esky, what you'd call an icebox down, and they'd sit around and have beers with these guys. The local women would... Um, uh, these boys are uh, a bit skinny, so they take them home and give them home-cooked meals. So that quarantine wasn't all that effective. And one day, a, a local contract, a co concrete contractor came down. He uh, had some leftover concrete, and he put that down, and the men put their feet in the, um, uh, in the concrete. And now that park, uh, that area has been made into a park named La Bolsa Park, uh, and the footprints are still there. And uh, it's one of our favourite places to go and have a drink and watch the world go by. But was he right? Was he Siri right? Had people gone, uh, migrated from South America into the Polynesian islands? No. He proved that it could have been done, but it wasn't done. Now, through DNA testing and carbon dating, we now know that those people did originate in that Taiwanese area and make their way out over centuries into the, the Pacific Islands. Tor Hala went on to have a, a great career. He went to Easter Island and was the first man to discover how those giant statues, the, the stone statues of Moai, were moved around by the locals. He wrote a book, Aku Aku, which became an international bestseller. Um, and later on, in 69, uh, he built a raft made out of papaya reeds called the Ra, 
Uh, and he tried to sail that from Morocco, where we were last week, uh, to Barbados to prove that people could have done that migration as well. The first raft failed, so he built another one, Ra 2, and this made it 3,300 nautical miles uh, from Morocco to Barbados and became famous. It was on the front page of National Geographic. They uh, made stamps out of it and things, uh, so it was very famous. And then in 77, he built another raft made of papaya, uh, the Tigris, and he wanted to prove that people could have gone from the Middle East to the Indian subcontinent. So it sailed from Iraq to Pakistan. And when it got there, he famously burnt the raft at a protest of all the wars that were taking place in the Middle East and uh, in uh, Asia, at that, at, sorry, in India and Pakistan at that time. So there's the, the raft burning. He died in 2002 and uh, all of Norway uh, mourned his death. In uh, 2014, Google made a Google Doogle to honour uh, the Kontiki expedition and he is one of his great sayings is borders. I have never seen one, but I've heard that they exist in the minds of some men. And that's a bit like the John Lennon, the song Imagine. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, that's the story of the Kontiki expedition. I'll be back tomorrow with a very, very special presentation about the Penley lifeboat disaster. H hope I'll see you then. Thank you very much.